It's Tammy with Real Southern Woman. It is late for Bible study, and a lot of you may already be in the bed. I would, I guess some of you might be. It's 9.45. Um, it has been a very long day for me. I have, uh, I'm really tired. I did not wash, I still haven't washed my hair because I'm going to color it tomorrow. When you color your hair, it's really good for it to have the oils in it. I personally am very dry skin and don't have a lot of oil in my scalp, so I wait quite a few days before I color my hair. So tomorrow, I promise, I will color my hair and roll it and look a little better for the rest of the week. Um, I may even color my hair live tomorrow for y'all on Real Southern Woman. Uh, since Chris has been gone, I've been able to click the button live a little bit more often. Um, I hope y'all got to see me uh, with the girls shopping. I was worn slap out. I went three different days shopping. The first, no, actually just two days. The first dress that May tried on, she bought. Um, it was a high dollar dress, but she's a senior and it's her only prom. I mean, and she didn't go to prom last year. This, um, with Amy, I went to a lot of stores because she does have the top heavy pro problem. And the crazy thing is we went, I don't know if I told y'all this or not, but we went in, uh, when we were in that store that you guys seen us in, um, there was a uh, Lane Bryant next to it, and Amy has not been sized for a bra in quite some time, and neither had her friend ever been sized for a bra, and they're both really large, you know, busts for their dresses, and that's hard to find a dress when you're built, um, you know, different than some of the teenagers. Now, there's plenty of girls out there that are built like those girls, but we went into Lane Bryant, and let me just say this too. The first little girl that helped them, she was a young girl, and she sized them completely wrong. And both of them tried on bras, and they were just killing them. So a grown woman went in the room and sized them. And um, the young girl had sized them as a triple D, and it was not working. And that's actually the last size that Amy was uh sized a couple of years ago, and this, when the older woman went in and sized them correctly, they both, actually, they both wore uh, 38H, so I would say Amy has grown quite a bit and needed some new bras, and poor little Keisha had not had, um, she had been wearing a D all of her life, and she was in an H, y'all, that's D, double D, triple D, E F G H. So she felt like she was just in heaven with a new bra on. It's amazing what uh, money can buy when you go to the right places because Lane Bryant is the place to get good bras if you are heavy. They have real wide straps, they have five clasps in the back, and they have a lot of support. So I got both of the girls a bra so that they will be comfortable for the prom. Um, Shannon wants to know where I get my dresses I wear around the house. Shannon, this is practically a moo moo gown. I don't care. This is Bible study. It is night at 945. And yes, I appreciate you understanding that it's okay for me to wear my gown. As long as it's not a revealing gown, it doesn't make any difference. This was actually my mother's. I got it out of her closet. What I love about this one is you can tell that it's like the, um, I forget what you call them, but what I like about it is it has a string in it that's sewn in if you, if you look at it wrong side out, and that's what's so cool about this one because most of them don't have that waistline. Most of you just look like this in them, but this one actually has a cord in it, and um, I don't really know where she got this at, uh, so I can't help you on that one, but just look for one that's large and has a, an actual cord in it. They're so comfy to wear around the house. They're long all the way to the floor. Mama don't like them anymore because they're too long. She likes short dresses because her legs have sores on them from the knee down. Both of her legs are covered. Um, they're just pitiful looking. 
Um, I, I did get to go to Mama's today. That's one reason I'm so tired. Um, I got up this morning. I took the dogs to the groomers. I went straight to Mama's. Um, got her out of the bed. I decided I'd help her with a shower. So we got in the shower. I changed her bed. Then I took her out. She decided she wanted to go out and eat in the lunch room, which she don't normally do. So um, they had some breakfast they had made, and <laughs> it was, you know, cold, and the grits were in a little bowl. And so I went over there, and I poured the grits in a bigger bowl, and I mixed I found some, uh, y'all, I'm so loud. I found some uh, coffee creamer in the refrigerator that was the sweet cream. I poured that in the grits, mixed them up really good, put them in the microwave, warmed them up, put the bacon in the microwave and warmed it up so it'd be crunchy. I actually cooked it a little longer because Mama, don't, she lost her bottom teeth. That's the second uh, set of bottom teeth she's lost since she lived there, so I'm not going to pay the money and have another set of teeth made for her. I know that's terrible, but she's got her top teeth and... I just hate to keep putting thousands of dollars in teeth when she can't really wear them and she don't like them and all she does is pull them out anyway. So um, I, when I make the bacon crunchy, it's easier really for her to chew it up and swallow it than if it's chewy. So I made it real crunchy, threw it in the uh, grits, threw the eggs in there and I made a grit ball. You know, the grits, the sugar, the salt, the pepper, the eggs, the bacon and sat down and she loved it. I actually had donuts. I went by Dunkin' this morning and got donuts for the staff. And uh, I gave Mama half of a blueberry. So she would take a bite of that grit bowl and she'd take a bite of the donut like it was a biscuit. It was so funny. She's so cute. And then there was a lady that come in. I met her. And I'm sorry, but I cannot remember her first name. And she was coming to see a friend of hers who was sitting across the table from Mama. And she liked the looks of the grit bowl. So I walked her over there. She was so sweet the girl that had come to see her, and showed her how I did it, and I told her about our page and all that stuff. But anyway, I had a good morning, but I'm just worn out because I came straight home, cleaned the kitchen, I cooked today. I had to put up all that meat. Um, I've, I'm just tired. I did get to take a relaxing bath, and that was nice. And You know, the older you get, the harder it is to get in and out of the tub, but I still like to do it every once in a while. I don't do it often, but sometimes I do. With that said, it's time for Bible study, and I haven't even turned on my TV, but I am watching Downton Abbey. I think Chris will probably come home tomorrow. I'm not that crazy about him driving in all the rain, but I think he probably will. I'll probably watch a, an episode of Downton Abbey before I go to bed. The other night, something terrible happened on that show. If you have never watched Downton Abbey and you know how to get Netflix or Amazon Prime, please watch that show. It's amazing. But one of them passed away. Oh my gosh, I was crying like a baby two nights ago. It's just it's so funny how you get attached to people on the show. Anyway, we're reading out Jeremiah today. Let me say this. I had a little lady that was watching me on the Bible study on YouTube, and she was kind of taken back by, by the fact that I used an ESV Bible um, now, you can tell your opinions or whatever, but we all have our own convictions. And I will say that I've always been a King James Version girl, but I'm going to tell y'all this, and y'all can take it with a grain of salt. Um, all, even the King James Version is a version of the Bible that was written down off of other, um, by, out of another version. In other words, it's not the first and only version of the Bible. Uh, I'm not sure why people think it is. I guess they just don't know any better. It has been in existence for 400 years. Um, I think it's 400 or maybe it's 16, 17, 18, 19. Yeah, about 400 years. Um, in 1611, I think is when it was written um, or came out as the version that we use now today. Um, I will say, though, that back then, it was all part partially because of the Catholic Church and Martin Luther, and he was very educated, got in there, and he seen that people did not have a hands-on Bible that they could read, and it was only up to the Catholic Church to tell them what was in the Bible, and he wanted people to be able to read the Word of God. That's why 
it was written um, so that it was in an English version so that people could actually read the Word of God because before then it was in other versions, Hebrew and Arabic. I can't remember. Y'all don't quote me on it. I'm not a scholar. But I do know that before the King James Bible, there's so many versions and there's even books of the Bible that aren't even a part of the Bible. Now, with that said, some people take the scripture that says, you cannot add or take away from this word, or it's like blasphemy or whatever. I don't know. You know, it's always something we've always heard. It's always something the Baptists say. And I'm not telling you that you should or shouldn't. All I'm telling you is that verse 2 has to be taken in context. Now, if that verse were true, then this Bible, this King James Version Bible, would be... A Bible that we could not read. We would have to go back to the version of the version that was before this one. Okay? So if you want to get that technical about it, then this is not the first version of the Bible. Okay? So you can't say that it's the only version and it's the best version. And if hell or one and or it or the is taken out of it, that it's a sin because that is not true because... This Bible was written out of other versions. Now, if you don't believe me, go look it up and read about it. Now, as far as the new versions, there are good new versions and there are bad new versions. There are, I mean, they're all, um, I, I tell you where the problem lies. It's not the version of the Bible you're reading. I notice I'm losing people, but it's not the, the version of the Bible you're reading so much as, it, are you really reading it anyway? Because a lot of these people that talk about, that talk this big talk, talk the big talk, they go to church, they listen to the preacher, they repeat what he tells them, and they never even really pick it up anyway. The whole reason the King James Version was written was that people could actually read the Word of God instead of relying on the Pope and the Catholic Church to tell them what God says. Okay? So... If you personally do not pick up your Bible and read it, and you're one of those people that just read it occasionally or read it with a Bible study, then um, you're not really getting much out of the Bible anyway, as much as you could if you read it. Um, yes, some of them take a few verses out, but I can guarantee you when the King James Version was written, they probably put a few verses in. So I'm just trying to tell you don't be so put out by technical issues that do not matter, and it's not what saves people. What God cares about and what he meant by taking away a word or putting in a word, in my opinion, and what the Holy Spirit has led me to believe, is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do they talk about Jesus? Do they say he is the Son of God? Do they tell you how to get saved? And does it change the gospel? The rest of the Bible is just helping you with the lineage of Christ, prophecies, different things. Um, what matters more than anything, and I believe it's what he meant when he said, don't take away the words or add the words, was with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Just as the last study that we talked about in Galatians, where uh, Paul jumps all over the people in the church for being judgmental on law and these little things this is another thing that people can be really ugly about if you cannot hold your tongue and act right and say things in a loving manner whether you're talking about a version of the bible or a story in the bible or something that you are trying to defend whether it's you need to wear a dress to church or whatever then your heart is not where it needs to be god looks at our heart on the inside not the external, all these little laws and all these little things is not what's important. What's more important to God is your relationship with him, if you love him or not, and are you sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. He gives us several commandments that he expects us to carry out, and it's not if you're just a preacher or a minister or a missionary. It's for each and every one of us. If you want to be a child of God and be included in the family of God and you want to be an heir to the throne, then don't think that he doesn't expect you. If he doesn't look at us as male or female and he doesn't look at us as poor or rich or Gentile or Jew, 
He also doesn't look at us and expect one of us to share the gospel and one of us not to. He expects us all to. So if you're sharing the gospel, that's good. And I hope and pray that you are loving God, loving people more than you're loving yourself, and sharing the gospel. Those three things are much more important than these little things that people make mountains out of. Those are the three things God tells us to clothe ourselves with humility. That is how we're to be clothed. He lets us know that love is the most important. If we love him and love other people, everything else in the fruits of the Spirit will flow out of us and his gospel will be shared because we will not want to hoard it up. Just like he says, you don't light a light on a candlestick and then stick it in a closet, okay? You let it shine. So let's let our light shine. Let's be good. Now, for the woman who felt that way about the ESV, I challenge you to read the history of the ESV. I challenge you to read the history of the King James Version, and I challenge you to look it up for yourself and not, she she took me, and I'm not saying, I'm, I'm not trying to be ugly, but she took me to a pastor preaching from a pulpit. That doesn't, that doesn't prove anything to me. I go by the Word of God, by history, by the facts, not by what somebody says or what somebody thinks, okay? So I, I challenge you to read about it, and I challenge you to, let me just say this, if you think that it's a sin to use another Bible, then you you need to put down your King James Version and go all the way back to the old scrolls. And then you couldn't even read them. And you would be like the people back before King James was written. And you would be you would have to rely on a man to tell you what it says. And that's not what God wants us to do. Now, I can guarantee you that... Um, God just wants us to do the things I've just told you to do and read his word. And he will let the Holy Spirit teach us and show us what we need to know. Uh, with that said, let's read our Bible study today. I gave y'all a, a little bit of preaching, but um, it's so funny. You know, every day when, you got it, when you're a YouTuber, you know, you got people that tell you about the the Bible you're reading, and you got people that tell you that you can't use margarine, and you got, you know, and, and I'm just saying, you know, don't sweat the small stuff, y'all. Just live. And I'm not saying you should loosen up and, 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 and go get drunk tonight or nothing and eat a bunch of margarine. I'm just saying, you know, y'all are making mountains out of molehills. Y'all are making mountains about things that God could care less about. The things that he wants you to do the most, you're probably not even doing. So don't be pointing fingers, okay? Think about it. When's the last time you led somebody to Christ? When's the last time you shared the gospel? When You know, do you shine, shine your light? Are you nice to people in the drive through Are you nice? You know what I mean? Let's do what God would have us do and quit making mountains out of molehills. Now, Today, it says, let's read this one. It says, believe it or not, I'm going to actually read a different one. Because guess what it says? After I said molded, it says being molded. So let's use it, right? February the 17th, behold, like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand. Jeremiah 18, verse 6. There is something inherently painful in realizing that God is working on us. That there's something about us that doesn't quite please him or fit his purpose. It hurts to think we fall short. But as our great potter, God sees the process differently. He works on us because he sees potential in us, and he has something important in mind for our lives. By the way, we are reading out of Charles Stanley, Jesus, Our Perfect Hope. I've even had people downgrade this book because it's written by Charles Stanley whose wife left him. Give me a break. We are all human and every man that God used and woman just about in the in the word of God had problems, dealt with family problems, sinned, things happen to them and it doesn't mean they're not worthy. You know why? Because none of us are worthy. A man that's been married to the same wo woman for 50 years is no more worthy than Charles Stanley. 
So don't sweat the small stuff. And I know Baptists think different than I'm Baptist, but I don't care. It's a bunch of bull crap. Okay, I'm just saying it. It's the truth. Jesus didn't pick out perfect people. The only perfect people on the face of the earth was Jesus Christ. He used people. If you were willing to be a vessel for Jesus Christ, no matter where you are, no matter who you are, no matter where you've been, he is ready and willing to let you spread the gospel. Okay? Don't think you are not worthy to spread the gospel. Because none of us are. Not one of us. Okay, it says, but as our great potter, God sees the process differently. He works on us because he sees potential in us and has something important in mind for our lives. It is actually a great honor because he is continuous, continuously molding us into the image of his son, giving us an appearance that is unmistakably his with increasing faith, capacity for his power, wisdom, and endurance. In other words, the Father applies his discipline to our lives, not out of anger or frustration, but out of his unconditional love and a wonderful vision of our place in his kingdom. It is not something that we should fear. Rather, we should embrace it as it is making us more worthwhile, more valuable, and effective. So don't get frustrated as God molds you. Instead, ask him to show you what, is his, what he is forming in you. Accept his leadership and grow stronger in him. Jesus, I trust you not only to mold me into something useful for your service, but to form your image in me. That's what Charles Stanley says today. I just want to say I love Charles Stanley, and I love any man that stands and proclaims the Word of God. I know that as much as you try to be a good husband or wife, you can never control and become the mind of your spouse. And you really never know anyone, anyone, anything can happen to any of us. And each and every one of us can fall into sin, even if our spouse is praying for us. So never point your finger. Just like Jesus said to the Pharisees, if you can cast the first stone, throw it. But none of us can, because we're all guilty of different things. So remember that. Always love people like Jesus did. He didn't love their sin, he loved the person. And he pointed out their sin. But he still loved each of us the same. None of us, he, he treats any different than the other. And I can guarantee you, when his disciples started talking to him before he was crucified about who was going to get to sit on the right side of Jesus Christ in heaven and who he was going to choose, you know, they wanted to see who was the most special to him. We're all special to him. That's what's sweet about it. We're all equal to him. That's what's wonderful about it. We're all children of God. No matter what color we are, no matter if we're male or female, if we're Jew or Gentile, wherever we are in this world, he has sent his son to die for each and every one of us. And we all, each and every one of us, fall short of the glory of God, as it says in Romans. I hope you have enjoyed my Bible study. I've preached a little bit. And I'm not saying I'm really preaching because I'm a woman, but anyway, you know what I'm saying. I can guarantee you one thing. God sure don't mind me, me letting him use him. I mean, he sure don't mind letting him use me uh, to spread the gospel. Um, I was going to tell you a little bit about Jeremiah. This, this uh, verse comes out of Jeremiah, and I do like to tell you where we are, where we are in the Bible, because I don't like to take anything out of the Bible without it being in context. Jeremiah is a prophetical book. It is one of those books that's hard to understand, so it's not one of them books that you can just pick up and read it and just know everything about what you've read. And uh, I believe that uh, came out of, let me look back at it, I think it was chapter 17. Let me look before we leave. Jeremiah 18, 6. I was close. Um, I'm just going to touch base on this book just for, you know, uh, for a minute. The book and prophet Jeremiah. 
This I'm reading out of the study Bible. It says the book and prophet Jeremiah hold at least two great distinctions among all the Old Testament prophets. This is the longest prophetical book in the Bible. 1364 verses, that's 1,364 verses in Jeremiah. And two, Jeremiah's life is more fully described than any of the other 15 writing prophets. So if you want to read a prophetical book that tells more of a story of the actual prophet, then this would be it. And two, the tumulus, 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 however you want to say it, times of the last half of the 17th century and the first quarter of the 6th century B.C. came this prophet bearing a word from God for the stubborn people of Judah. And some of these people I'm telling you about with their beliefs are so doggone stubborn and they, and they make those more important than what's important. The book's contents span roughly from 640 to 580 B.C. Um, my dogs decided to talk about that. So that means this book was written before Christ was born. About 640 to 580 years before Christ was born. This Bible has been in existence, the King James Bible, 400 years. So this was written... More years before he was born than, than the actual book that we're, we've got. When you think about it in biblical timeline, the King James Bible is, it's old and it has stood the, you know, has stood the test of time, but it's still, uh, not, it wasn't written until 1600 years after Christ passed away. You know what I'm saying? So, um, it wasn't the first book. Let's see, I wanted to go back to Jeremiah 18, and some of the new versions are pretty bad, I have to say. So if you're a little confused about, you know, whether or not you should really follow a version, I personally think the ESV is fine. Yes, it takes out some verses, and yes, it takes out some words, but I still think it's fine for reading the Bible and studying, like if you're doing a Bible study like we're doing, because when you read it, you don't have to explain what the words mean while you're reading it. Um, as far as just doing a, an old-fashioned Bible study, like studying, studying the words, you could always use the KJV. Or when you're just doing your daily Bible reading, if, you're, if you have, have a conviction for it. Uh, January, let's see, Jeremiah 18, the potter's vessel of clay. Um, I was just going to see what this had to say. Like the episode with the undergarment, the trip to the potter's house provided Jeremiah with a symbolic action message. Pottery making was very common in the ancient Near East. Potters commonly used wheels turned by foot as they shaped a lump of clay with their hands. The vessel was then fired into a kiln to make it hard. The vessel the potter was working on was marred. But how or why this happened is not stated. The Lord was the potter, and Israel, later the nations as well, were the clay. So he's talking about Israel in this passage. The lesson of the potter illustrates God's grace for all who will repent and turn back to him. God threatened to pluck up and pull down and to destroy any wicked nation. But he promised to build and to plant and re a repentant one. Wouldn't we rather be a repentant nation so that we can have the promise of building and planting and not the promise of plucking, pulling down, and destroying from God? It says God never changes his character, nature, or being. But he changes his actions toward humans when they change their response to him. So, it, and, it, and it keeps on saying, I'm going to say this one more thing. It says, the word frame is related to the word potter. The word choice was deliberate, so Judah would grasp the connection. It was God's right to fashion disaster for Judah. So, um, back in this time, they used certain words that they knew what, these, you know, languages, these people, of these nations knew what they meant. And, of course, we have to be told what they meant because they don't mean the same thing to us. And so he's just letting us know that this is one of those words as what is named frame would be potter for us. I hope you've enjoyed today's Bible study. 
I hope you can see that God does put us on that potter's wheel if we let him. If we let him be a part of our life, he can mold us into something. And he can use us if we're willing to let him use us as his vessel, which is this vessel he has on this potter's wheel. I hope you have a good night. Let's say our prayers. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so very much. We thank you for your word, and we pray, Lord, for any reason, if there's any one of us who has bitterness or hatred or hate or um, not only that, but pride in what we believe because of something someone's told us, that you would help us in your word, look it up, and not just look at one verse, but take it into context, Lord. And I pray that our hearts would find that the reason you sent your son here was for the age of grace, and that's where we live. We live in the age of grace where we are to live by faith and faith alone. We really are, and I pray that we would be released from all of this really distraction so that we can focus on what you would have us do the most, which is love you, love each other, and spread the gospel. If you would just please work on us as vessels, um, we would just be happy and praise you for it. In Christ's name we pray, amen. I hope y'all have a good night. Y'all have sweet dreams. I'm about to go relax and watch Downton Abbey. Bye, I love ya.